Hello, friends, and welcome to the show. Happy Tuesday to you. What a treat. I'm so excited to be here with you. I hope you're excited to be here with me because I am doing a special show and a very special guest is coming up. But before I get started, remember, you're part of today's live level up conversation. So let's have some fun. Welcome to Level Up with Winnie Sun. Hello, friends. I'm Winnie Sun, your host, Forbes contributor, CNBC council member, an award-winning financial pro here to keep you on top of relevant trending business news. But most importantly, you know, you're part of today's discussion. So we're going to be sharing audience feedback during our community moment. Let me just say that today I want to welcome you back because we have a very special guest with us. I did tease it earlier in the show, but as you know, she's an award-winning documentarian, a journalist, a speaker, author, philanthropist who founded a multi-platform media production company dedicated to telling empowering and authentic stories on a range of social issues. I'm a huge fan of hers. I follow her for for years, in fact. But before we jump to her, I just want to tell you where the market is currently, so that way you can keep track. The Dow is currently up 226 points. The S&P is up 49 points. And the NASDAQ is up 283 points, positive across the board currently. The financial markets are certainly responding. They do sense hope. And so the U.S. stock markets have rebounded today. The market hasn't closed yet, but the federal, as you know, Fed Chair Jerome Powell's latest talk about inflation and being proactive um, is certainly something that investors are feeling more confident about. However, the Ukraine war isn't over and neither is a pandemic. So we should and we will see more volatility in the coming days and weeks. But before we do that, you know, I think what we're really excited about today is I want to welcome back friend Soledad O'Brien. CEO of Soledad O'Brien Productions. Soledad, how are you today? Hey, I'm great. Nice to see you. How are you? Well, I'm so excited to have you here. I'm doing well. And and thank you so much for being here. I've been following you on Twitter. A lot of exciting things that you've been working on. Lots of pictures of my dogs, uh, yes. occasionally a horse or two. And yeah, you know, we... Um, I, I, I like to very much keep my hand on the stories that are unfolding, whether I'm reporting them or not. And then, of course, so there's a lot happening, obviously, with the Supreme Court uh, and then uh, what's happening in Ukraine and lots of really great reporters covering that story. So I, I do. I try to keep my fingers in all of it. You do keep your fingers in all of it because I feel like you are part, of, you do so much, right? You anchor, you produce Hearst TV political magazine program, Matter of Fact by Solo Baron. I feel like it goes on and on. Correspondent for HBO Real Sports. A also, lot of jobs. That's a you lot. You do have, <laughs> do you ever feel like when you hear all these things, you're like, how do I even as one person accomplish as much as you do? Yeah, you know what's funny? It's every time you, you mention them, it really is a team of people. Like Real Sports is a great example, which is a really amazing team. And I go and join them on shoots, but there's a zillion people behind the scenes who make all of that happen. The same thing with Matter of Fact. It's got my name on it, which means in a little bit of a way I'm a quarterback. But we have a great team that actually makes sure that a really good show gets on the air every uh, every single week. So, no, it's not very overwhelming because I realize, like, I, I, I don't think I'm extended yet. I like doing a lot of things and I like doing a lot of different things. So, um so where I get into trouble is I'll say, you know, maybe I should take an art class. Maybe I should take a business class. Maybe I should think about, you know, going horseback riding. Maybe I should think about, you know, gardening. And, and then then my life gets a little bit uh, chaotic. Uh, but work -wise, <laughs> you know, with good people, you can make a lot happen. So if we're hearing this right, so that like when you're around good people, you can get a lot done. Oh but when gosh. you try and do things that like gardening and art and whatnot that don't involve other people, it gets a little overwhelming. That sounds yeah. like I put on my resolution list, learn to cook for many years. And eventually I just took it off because I was like, it's stressing me out. I don't really like cooking. It's just not going to happen. So, yeah, certain things I think you just have to give up and be like, it's, it's not going to happen this go around. Of my yeah, life. I think so. I think you just focus on the eating and, you know, not the oh, cleaning. I'm good with cleaning. Cleaning, yeah. 
Okay, good. Well, you know, gardening isn't that far from cleaning, but I mean, yeah, you need to keep things alive. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) That's true. Well, let's talk about this. You know, um, we know how just your your background is so impressive. You got over 1.3 million followers on Twitter, myself included. You know, I've seen so much of your dialogue recently about some of your recent projects, certainly lots of uh, about pictures of your beautiful dog as well. Um, But what I love, though, I love to get your insight about – you know, current political front Mm -hmm. and your feelings. And what I love about it is that you are certainly completely inclusive. Like I haven't seen a group where you have alienated. I feel like you're a great speaker for those who can't speak for themselves. So I was hoping you might be able to start from the beginning and maybe tell Mm -hmm. us a little bit about your backstory. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I started working in TV news. I grew up in Long Island. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a professor. Uh, in Long Island. My parents were an interracial couple. My mom was black. My dad was white. And so when they were first looking for a house, actually in the 1960s in Long Island, no one would sell to them because here in the United States, people did not allow black people to move in certain neighborhoods, as you well know. There was lots of redlining. Um, And so I went to public school in Long Island. I went to Harvard College. I started working in TV at a local station, WBZ TV. And I think that's where I really grew an interest in figuring out what kinds of stories that I, I wanted to tell. And I, I think in local news, especially, they're the kind of stories that put you on the path to move ahead and get promoted. And then there are like community stories, which you know are what we would call the D block, the end of the show stories. And often those show those pieces don't really grow your career. They're nice to do, but I don't think they get a ton of respect. And so my goal was to always do, you know, what's the A block story? How do I do that? But the ones I really like to do are the B, the D block stories, the ones about communities and things that I think people back then in the 80s thought were very soft. Education, housing, now we know those things are absolutely not soft stories, um, sometimes even like women's stories. They're they're essential. They're all about the fabric of society. Uh, and so I think over time, those stories have actually moved to the forefront. And, uh, and so I've really been grateful and I've really enjoyed covering those kinds of stories. So I did that in local news and I went to NBC News to work with a guy named Bob Bazell, who was a medical and science correspondent at NBC as his, one of his producers. I was an associate producer there. Then I went out to San Francisco to start reporting for the NBC affiliate there. Uh, went back to NBC to start anchoring. Uh, I anchored the Weekend Today show for a while. Went over to CNN, worked at CNN for about 10 years as an anchor and a correspondent. And then left after that 10 years to start my own production company, which was a very steep learning curve. You know, I, I'd never run anything. And so, you know, figuring that out in a lot of ways is trial and error. I mean, I'd been an anchor and a reporter. I knew how to go out in the field, but I certainly didn't know how do you structure a business? How do you think about... Um, you know, profit and loss, and how do you think about your operations? All those were things that I had to learn. And and you kind of have to learn them the hard way. I wish I knew an easy way, but I just don't know an easy way to learn them. So, you know, it's been a really interesting ride. Every step of the way, I've had a chance to work, again, on those stories that I cared about. Uh, and I think those stories have also become the A block stories, the stories about how people are living and, and, um, And stories around how people who I think who often don't get a lot of attention or whose stories are undercovered are starting to get more attention. And I've been able to do a lot of that. So I've I've felt very uh, rewarded and very um, happy with the work that I've had the chance to do over the last 30 some odd years. Yeah, it's been incredible. And thank you so much for sharing that, Soledad. You know, you talked about how you started your own production company and there were challenges there, right? It was a little overwhelming. So now that you've seen both sides, you've seen the business side, you you obviously lead in the creative side. Which one do you prefer? You know, I think that they go hand in hand. You know, the, the interesting thing about running a production company is you can't do the creative side without someone funding the business side, right? Mm-hmm. So you actually have to figure out what are the stories that people want to buy? How do you sell them? Who are your partners? How do you create a riveting story? How do you win? Um, you know, so you need the business. When I worked at a network like NBC or CNN, you know, you walk in, you pitch a story. I was never responsible for the finances around it, but now I am. And so I, I think they go hand in hand. Uh, you certainly just can't come up with anything that's not viable and and hope that people will will you know, you can sell something. It just doesn't really work that way. So I think it's a combination of finding interesting, compelling stories, figuring out how you want to tell them in creative ways that haven't really been done before, and then make sure that financially you can present something that you can get someone to purchase, someone to buy and fund. 
So, so, so that you get frustrated by that because sometimes I'm sure there's stories that you want to share, right? And we, we're going to go to your talking about your docu stories. There's going to be stories that you're real adamant. You feel like this is really important. I know this and social justice is very important to you. You'll feel like there should be more audience and more um, interest in that project, but then you can't get the funding. Um, have you dealt with that? And so, um, how did you? Yeah, you know, yes, sort of, right? I don't know that you can be frustrated at the system any more than when I was at CNN. I would push, I would pitch projects and people would say no, you know, and they, that just meant no. I think today there are so many other platforms, right? So, Winnie, if you and I said, boy, there's a really interesting story over here and we can't find somebody who wants to uh, turn it into a six part docuseries on mm -hmm. a streaming uh, network you know, then you and I could literally do a podcast about it like yep. tomorrow, you know, and we would sit down and, and we could write a book about it and we could publish an article about it. And we could do uh, a YouTube series. On, like we literally yep. could take advantage of all these platforms. And just because someone has sort of said no to us, it wouldn't mean that we wouldn't do it. We might do various iterations. And then one day someone will say, you know, that is a good idea. You guys, let's, let, let's do that as a six part series. And we would have proven out the model. So I think it's less frustrating than it was for me when I worked at a network where, you know, you have often had gatekeepers. I remember actually toward the end of my time at CNN, I pitched doing a doc um, about poverty in America. We had done black in America, Latino in America, gay in America, education in America. And the, my boss at the time, who still works in TV news, said, ugh, poverty in America, ugh, who wants to see that? Mm. You know, and you're thinking like, well, I think you really have a deep misunderstanding about what American poverty looks like. Right. Most people in poverty have jobs. Mm -hmm. Many work 40 hours a week. In fact, they have multiple jobs. Uh, some are living in their cars because they actually can't afford to find housing, right? The story of poverty in America is actually a very compelling and complex story, right? The fact that there's just no housing that you can find, even if you're working full time, to me is an interesting element. So that was frustrating to me because sometimes you had gatekeepers who just didn't really care about the topic, mm -hmm. you know, and if it didn't seem to strike their fancy, then you just weren't going to get to do it. Right. It's, it's so interesting. And, and I completely agree with you. I mean, there's so many different levels of poverty. And I remember that even as a child, right? And and going through when once a month, we got to go to Burger King and have a burger. And that was a big deal because that was special. You just didn't have a lot. But I think that many people across the globe can relate to that. And so I want to talk about your docu-series because I know you share some clips on social and I know it's doing very, very well. And I think it's a really important message. I think, you know, I've watched and and your clips and I've read what you've talked about. And it even to me, sometimes it surprises me that in 2022, that this is still something that is so real. Can you talk a little bit about the project? Sure, absolutely. The, the doc series is called Black and Missing. And I'm going to brag for a minute. I'm not a big bragger, but I'm going to brag for a minute. Uh, we just won an Independent Spirit Award, which is a big deal. Congratulations. Uh, so we got to go to LA to, to get that award the other day and an NAACP award for our directors on that project. And it's really about two women, uh, Derica and Natalie Wilson, who are sisters-in-law, who started the Black and Missing Foundation because they were sick of the fact that there were so many um, black people, people of color who were just missing and who the media didn't really cover and who law enforcement didn't really seem to care to focus on and, and who community didn't even necessarily know that they were missing. So we wanted to tell that story. And it's interesting because, you know, I know having worked in news, local and network news for a long time, that there was always this bias when it came to missing people. Like if you're going to go missing, make sure you're really pretty and be really young, right? Because that that's wow. going to be a much greater chance that you're going to be profiled, um, that that there was a sense, again, that the gatekeepers, you know, only wanted to really do wall-to-wall -wall coverage on certain kinds of people, often young white women who'd gone missing. And so our doc series really looked at why the media does that and some of the frustration that these two sisters-in-law have with that. And and why does law enforcement, you know, it's a it's a vicious or sometimes virtuous circle you know, if the media is paying attention, then law enforcement often has to pay more attention, which then brings it back around to the community pays more attention, which means the media pays more attention. Uh, or if the media ignores you, then law enforcement can ignore you, then the community can ignore you. And you have a circle in that way as well. So we really wanted to kind of look at why is that? Why, why are these young women, 
who are missing, who are young and attractive and vibrant, who have crazy stories around what happened, why don't they get the coverage that other people do? And so uh, really trying to dig into that was a, a really fascinating project. And again, it kind of fit into what we do, which is saying, this is a story that's been flying under the radar. And how do we bring our focus on it to help elevate this issue? Yes, so important. And, you know, I think, you know, it, it's such a challenging story, right? It's true. Why aren't they focused just as much as someone else who's younger and more attractive? It's wrong. But do you think going through this process, was there anything that surprised you? Do you think uh, things will change because of the project that you did? I, actually, I do, because the number of people who've started, I, I think some of it's just recognizing that we have a bias, you know, that the gatekeepers, you know, think certain people are worthy of covering and, and other people, if you're poor, for example, if you're black, for example, if maybe you're middle-aged, for example, you know, that like maybe the audience doesn't want to see that. I mean, I've, I've had executives tell me that, ugh, the audience doesn't want to see that when they're wrong. I think the audience actually is very interested in a nuanced story, good storytelling. So I do think it's going to change because I think there's been a lot of recognition around the data. There are so many people of color who are missing and yet way, way underrepresented when it comes to both law enforcement paying attention to those those folks and also uh, the media covering them. So I, I do think, I mean, I've seen it. I've seen people aggressively try to change their strategy. So that gives me a tremendous amount of hope for um for changing in the, the the macro that people you know proactively care about these communities, I love that. Well, let's talk about this. Let's talk about uh, the the play of media in activism mm -hmm. and bringing change. You talked about um, one area. Do you think? I guess what are some other opportunities that you feel that we can play more of a role in social change? That's such an interesting question, right? Because I think sometimes activism gets such a bad rap. Like even I'm like, oh, activists. I don't know. I. I, like I don't know, is it is it is it's is it like saying, hey, people shouldn't be racist? Is that being an activist or is that just being like a normal person? Um, so I, I don't I don't think it's about activism for me. I think it's about engaging in your community. I, like I think the women who are trying to make law enforcement do their jobs, like I don't know that I'd call them activists. And maybe it's on my own like weird definition of activists in my head. I, I think I would say like, they're just good community members who think something's wrong and it's just not fair. I don't think that they're necessarily, you know, I think of activists as like marching and demanding and, you know, which some people do. Um, but I don't, I don't see them like that. I see them as like, they are in a community and they deserve the exact same thing that everybody else deserves. And they're just asking for it. So I guess I sometimes like, I sometimes, um, uh, like get a little cringy when it comes to the word activist. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, know, I, mean, I have lots of friends who are like what I would consider to be activists. They march, they demand, they they protest. Um, but I don't think these women are activists. I think they're just, and I don't think demanding certain things um, makes you an activist. I think it just makes you involved in your community. It just makes you, and it shows that you care, right? I, I mean, I love the, the tweet that you have pinned on your Twitter profile about the background of your mom. And it really resonated with me because I remember my mom, when I was in nursery school or a preschool, my mom went and said, you know, the food that you're feeding kids isn't good. And it was just having women who decided, moms, that decided that it had to be fair and things should be right. And if not, we're going to speak up and do something about it. I love this. You know, I want to segue a little bit, if you can, so let uh, talk about what do you think is a common misconception that people have about you? About me? Oh, gosh, that's such a great question. I don't know. I'm pretty wide open on Twitter. Uh, so uh, so I don't know. I think pretty people know me pretty well. I do get a lot of I thought you'd be taller, <laughs> which is like, I'm five, five, I'm average height for a woman. So I'm not <laughs> short. I'm not tall. So I always think that's kind of weird. Um, but I, I don't know. I I've been on TV a long time and I've always been on shows where you reveal a lot about yourself. And I, I, I try to be pretty straightforward. I mean, I talk about what I want to talk about on social media. You know, I have, my husband does not like to be talked about, so he doesn't, he doesn't really have a starring role. My kids <laughs> need to edit the pictures heavily. They're like, do not post pictures of us without our permission. So, you know, the dogs don't get a say. So I, I give them, you know, I put them on a lot. Um, so it really kind of depends. But I, I think I'm kind of an open book. I wrote a memoir in 2010, and I tried to tell a lot of stories about um, my upbringing. I think I, in a lot of ways, I had your 
classic, like I grew up middle class in Long Island. My parents were not well off, but they weren't poor. They were just middle class and they were, they had a lot of luxuries in terms of they were home a lot. They're both educators. Uh, they valued education. I went to a really good public school in Long Island. They'd both been to college. So when it came time for us to go to college, we had an easy path because we had parents who knew how to do it. And I had four older brothers and sisters. So I really had an easy path. They had all done it years before me. So in a lot of ways, I've always thought about advantages that I had. Even though I was solidly middle class, I really came into this world with a great number of advantages. You know, just having parents who were together, um, mm -hmm. having parents who were in very solid jobs. So there was never, you know, a big like worry about finances. We didn't have a ton of money. I wanted Jordache jeans so desperately <laughs> when I was in We all did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And my mother was like, never. <laughs> but... But I think that, you know, like that was probably my biggest drama of my young life. Um, but I think having parents who were around and available and could be helpful for everything was a, a tremendous advantage. When my husband and I started our, we have a nonprofit that sends girls off to college. It was one of the things that we were trying to figure out, like, how do you help people get some of those um those social advantages, right? If when you have parents who've gone off to college, your path to college is much easier. You just know how to do it. You know, when you have parents who work in an office, your, your path to work is much easier because you have people who know how to do that. And a lot of the young women I work with just haven't had that exposure. Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of people are listening and are like, well, we're curious, when did you, when do you feel like you found your way? Like when did you huh. start to feel better? That's such a great question. Um, I would say I knew I found my way work-wise, probably covering Hurricane Katrina. Like, I felt like if you've ever had that feeling of firing on all cylinders, like, yes, I got it. Um, I, I, I understood what the job was. And I think the job was in serving an audience. And I started to shift my focus to being on TV and to, like, how do I help people understand this information? How do I add context? My job is to educate and inform people about an issue. And I think Katrina for me was a very, it was an opportunity to become good at that. And I did a good job and I think CNN did a really good job and uh, we won a bunch of awards for it. But I think I really kind of shifted my perspective. So work-wise, I think it was like, oh, this is what the job is, the job is taking something complicated and help break it down for your audience. Like if your audience walks away confused, you have sucked at your job, you know, and you don't tell me, well, you know, it's complicated or it's like, no, no, your job is to help people understand. So that was a very important and big shift for me. I think yeah. in my personal life and life generally, I had four kids under four at one point, and that was just so overwhelming. They're like a big chunk of my life is a oh, <laughs> Um but, you know, I think once they got to a certain age, I think when the youngest, when my twins, my youngest boys were four, uh, so I had like four, six, and eight, two fours, a six, and an eight, um, I think then I began to figure it out. Like, it was like, okay, I got this parenting thing. Not very well, but enough to like make it through the day. And uh, But it was really getting my little ones to about four years old that in my personal life, you know, Brad and I felt like, okay, we can manage this. You know, it was hard. It was hard. And I think as you get older, one of the nice things about I'll be 56 this year, one of the nice things is that you kind of get off your own case, you know, like yes. not, and everything's not going to be perfect. You're going to do the best you can. And, and, you know, and if you mess it up or something goes wrong, you just try again, again, you know, try again tomorrow. Like when I was younger, I think I felt all those things very deeply. And now I'm just like, it's all good. There's lots of good opportunities. Not everyone is going to be for you. Sometimes it misses you and you just move on and go grab the next thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love so much about what you just shared. I, I think that, you know, your superpower part of it was becoming a parent of four children under four. That's incredible. Well, yeah, I was aiming for three. I had twins. It was a big surprise. Yeah, that, that is a big surprise. I'm curious though. So who cooks in the house? I mean, who feeds these Little, or First I guess you're not little. No, I do not cook. I actually, I cannot <laughs> stand cooking. I, my mom was an amazing cook. My dad was like a decent griller, but my mom was a phenomenal cook of Cuban food. And Cuban food is amazing. And she was a great cook. Uh, so I don't cook at all. In fact, during the pandemic, it was actually a little bit challenging because <laughs> I, we, every, you know, all the kids were at home. My two daughters are in college, but they were all home. Everything mm -hmm. was remote. But my oldest daughter, Sophia, is a fantastic cook. Fantastic. 
and obviously did not learn it from me. She learned it from my mother-in-law. Uh, and she, you know, and she also just, uh, and Instagram, but she's a fabulous, fabulous cook uh, and has been since she was a little small. I remember making a, a chocolate tort with her when she was about eight years old and she was, you know, she's like a fantastic cook and I'm, I'll, I'll do the dishes and I'll go buy the groceries and I'll do everything but the cooking part. And that's kind of how we got through the pandemic. Like the way they get fed and the boys eat a lot was Sophia would cook for everybody. And then every so often I would say, every two weeks, she'd get very frustrated with her brothers. And she would say, that's it. I am done. <laughs> and she would, she, she's a great cook. So she'd make herself a little sa arugula salad with sliced strawberries, <laughs> get a fork, <laughs> go up to her bedroom and eat it by herself. <laughs> and leave everybody else with no food. Like you're on your own. I'm done. I, you know, I have an air fryer. So I was like, I can make tater tots. I can make okay. really grill. <laughs> So, so I, don't mess with Sophia because oh, yeah. everyone, everyone gets would, salad. Everyone would have to beg her to come back. Please, Sophia, please. <laughs> that's power. Don't you know, let that's, mom, that's, don't let mom cook. So yeah. Yeah, yeah she's good. She's very well, good. She's good. I'm you know what? Food is a power. We just should, that, that's case in point right there. All right. So I, I gotta ask you this. I wanna know um this. What else would you like to share that I didn't ask you? Oh my gosh. Um you know, I guess something that I would love to share is a question that I'm asked a lot. I think sometimes people feel stuck in leaving a situation that might not be good, but it feels scarier to go. And I've had to do that a couple of times in my career. So I'm asked about it a lot. And I would say, you know, I think it's really important to do the groundwork on it. You know, one, reach out to all your connections, like figure out, you know, get people's advice. I think it's, I, I worked with a young woman once who the day she quit, she was a producer on a show that I was doing and she quit and we had a cake for her and she took off her name tag and she smashed it in the middle of the cake. And I'm always like, don't do that. That's a terrible way to quit. Don't do that. Uh, but I think there's a lot of ways to really prep and plan and network in order to figure out what your next thing is. I think it's a really bad strategy to stay at a place where your bosses don't believe in you. It's very disheartening. And so... I've had a couple of times in my career where I thought I could do things and other people may not have quite believed it. And, you know, it really made a lot of sense to me to be like, I should go someplace where people believe in what I can do. And I, I think that's really important. You know, as we, I know you've talked about a lot is like the great resignation, you know, and I, I think a, a part of that is people sort of deciding like there's a whole life out there to, to lead and, 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 and your wealth and your life and your value, like all of that is not just about a number in your bank account or, you know, the title of your job. Like, are you enjoying your life? Like you, you can have a job that you love. You can work with people you like. Starting my own production company has been great because I literally partner with people I like and people I don't like, I don't work with. And it is really refreshing to be like, yeah, we should not work together. I'm good. Uh, it's a it's a it's a real luxury. It is a luxury to be able to do that. Absolutely, that's one of the blessings of being self-employed. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Well, we're gonna have some fun now, so Dad. We're gonna put you on the hot seat. We're gonna do speed round. Love it. You ready? Speed round. And thank you so much, Carlos and Crosshead Fighter and Joshua and Charles and Sadiq and so many of uh, all of you on the different networks joining us today. It is such a treat to have you here with us. I'm seeing your comments. We're definitely going to get to them uh, at the end of the show. But thank you so much for being here. Let's go to Soledad. we got two quick questions and give her about two minutes to answer them. Um, so that first question for you is, what in your adult life has been your greatest disappointment mm. experience? And what did you learn from it? Hmm. That's such a great question. And no one has ever asked me that. Um, I, you know, I don't know that I've had a great disappointment, uh, I, partly because of my mindset. Like, I just don't see the world that way. I don't. Most of the things that I have found disappointing or things that didn't work out or projects that I've done that, didn't, you know, they, it kind of made sense at the end, like either open another door. So it's hard to it's hard to say, well, this was terrible because either you met someone out of it or you you gain something from it. Uh, I've worked on projects that I, I thought were difficult with difficult people and and that was a big disappointment, but I wouldn't say it was the greatest disappointment. I don't know, I don't really think in terms of great, 
I don't think in terms of great disappointments, I haven't had a lot. Um, and things that don't go well, I tend to run and not do them again. Um, I don't know. I, I don't, I really don't have a good answer for that because I just don't, I don't, I, I haven't, I, I've gotten jobs, I've lost jobs, I, but I don't think of them as like my greatest disappointment. My job will never be something that'll be like my greatest disappointment. Um, my kids, thank God, are mostly healthy and happy. So they, they've been a, an absolute joy. And um, my greatest disappointment was not getting into Bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't understand it and I still don't understand it. And a bunch of my friends have a zillion dollars in Bitcoin and go on vacation on their Bitcoin. Uh, I'm not telling anybody to go and buy Bitcoin. But, but if I had to pick a thing where I missed the window and I'm beating myself up a little bit, it would be a little bit of that. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. All right. This question I think I'll like, and you know, we believe that everybody has their own yes factor, AKA their superpower. And I think you talked about it a little bit before, but what would you say is yours? Nope. You know, I actually have a great answer for that. And I think it goes a little bit into the first question. I'm a very resilient person. I have a plan A, that doesn't work out. I turn to plan B, that doesn't work out. I turn to plan C, it might be down to plan F. I know, like, I just don't get mired in disappointment. I just don't. And it's helpful when you're a reporter because you go out on a story and something goes awry or the story changes or what you thought you knew, it turns out you were wrong and you didn't know. And so I'm very flexible about kind of turning on a dime. Uh, and that's really, really helpful in my career. But I think also in life, like I'm just... You know, I often my mom had a great saying, which was take 24 hours and and uh, and you have 24 hours, you can cry, like just be sad for 20. But then after 20 hour, 25, get out of bed and, and get over it and move forward. And I'm very much that person. I make lists and I move forward. So I think being very genuinely resilient when something is not good, I I kind of have drama for about 24 hours and then I start making lists. OK, pros and cons. What do I do next? How do I rebound from this? And I, I think that's been a real strength of mine in everything I've tried to do. I love that. 24 hours, 25 hours. Thank you so much, Mom. I think we can all relate to that. And we're definitely going to hold on to that. And thank you so much, Soledad, for your generosity. You're just your friend. You're just amazing. I just oh, adore just so you. Thank you. Yeah, you are incredible. If you don't follow her already on social, where should they go? Where do you prefer? I'm guessing it's a little Tweety Bird, but... I yeah, know. you know, uh, I'm on. So I, I would say I do mostly Twitter and Instagram, and they're both at Soledad O'Brien. So nice and easy. And I do a show for her. So it's a syndicated show. So you can check local listings. It's a weekend show that looks at policy and politics. And it's called Matter of Fact with Soledad O'Brien. And I'm a correspondent for HBO Real Sports, which is amazing. And if you uh, if you check out HBO Real Sports, um, you will find me there. Amazing, amazing. And definitely give your, yeah, definitely follow her on Twitter and turn on the alert. That's what I did. It's, she, <laughs> it's really fun to follow. And thank you so much, my friends, for watching and supporting this program. If you could do me a favor and take a moment to share this show with someone that you care about, I'd really appreciate it. And as a reminder, you can find full episodes of Level Up with Winnie Sun on NASDAQ, CW San Francisco, Amazon Fire Roku, and a few other platforms. And we're excited to share that Yes Factor, our brand new podcast is now available anywhere that you listen to tune in to podcasts. So definitely tune in. We would love to see your comments on that. Be well, and I can't wait to see you again tomorrow. Take care now.